ही है घर जहाँ डर हो ना फिकर मिट्टी की जहाँ आए खुशबू जहाँ खाब हो फलक पर और सांसों में सबर जहाँ खुद से हो तू रूबरू जो देखे कभी सोचे तो जान ले है कितना खुश किस्मत तू लेट्स सेलिब्रेट द जॉय ऑफ लाइफ एवरीवन एंड अ वेरी वार्म वेलकम टू व्हाट आई कैन टेक्निकली कॉल द फर्स्ट एवर इन पर्सन एपिसोड ऑफ यूनिवर्स राइट्स एज अ सीरीज इन एसोसिएशन विद प्रभाकर फाउंडेशन presented by Shri Simmons and this time we also have the uh, Netherlands Veteran Fund, the Dutch Foundation for Literature supporting the evening today, along with SAS Women of Jaipur and Spadia Foundation and of course Yahi. Um, before I extol on who our speakers are for this evening, I'd like to explain that Universe Rights is a series we began during the pandemic when we couldn't travel and uh, I reached out to Prabhupada Foundation saying that since we can't get our international voices heard in person, can we at least start something like this for them virtually? So that is the birth of universe rights in the middle of all of this horror that was going on. We just tried to engage with each other on Zoom and uh, finally we said let's just now start the way we like to do our events. Uh, cozy, very intimate, small audience, but a very engaged audience. You know, you can clap for yourselves. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome Renate Shipper, who is an Emeritus Professor of Intercultural Literary Studies at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Uh, she's also a visiting professor in a plethora of countries broadly in all over Europe, USA, Africa, China, and she's an author of various international best-selling books. And uh, although I'm sure it's a very serious film, and I'm, only, I'm going to be honest, I haven't read this one, Never Marry a Woman with Big Feet. <laughs> the title itself grabs you, but I, I read about the book, so I know what it's all about. Uh, the other one is Naked or Covered, A History of Dressing and Undressing Around the World. And the latest book, which we are also going to be speaking about here, is Hills of Paradise, Power, Powerlessness, and the Female Body, which was released in July this year through Speaking Tiger, one of our publishers here. I'm leaving Medike in very capable hands of Major Dr. Meeta Singh, who all of you know is a doctor, a soldier, a humanitarian. She works uh, for girl child empowerment, dignity of the marginalized, the disadvantaged. She also, I have seen her on ground actively handling very, very difficult, sensitive cases. And in fact, she's bailed me one uh, out once for a certain incident that happened with one of the girls. And um, it's, it's not surprising that she's been honored by with, with awards uh, such as the Outstanding Women Award by the National Commission for, uh, of Women for Women's Women. And there is other, there lots, there's lots here, so I'm not going to get into that. But uh, I know we are few of us, but we can show some more energy for our speakers. Now. I will welcome Minike and Mita both on stage and hand over the evening to both of you. Thank you so much. Just a couple of things. Um, when we break into the question and answer sessions, uh, just keep your question to be a question, not a comment, and not more than a sentence, please. Thank you. And your owns have to be in silent. Today, we are really honored to have Minike Shippa uh, with us. She is, uh, as Mita just told us, a Dutch author of international fame. She's written more than 30 books. Can you imagine? So, a clap for that. And the books are varied. They touch upon uh, the oral text. She has done the seemingly impossible task of collecting, gathering stories, myths, 
fables and uh, local folklore. And collecting is one thing, gathering is one thing. She's not just collected them, she's collated them. She has compartmentalized them into a, an orderly fashion and brought out a bestseller called Never Marry a Woman with Big Feet. Now this title is very exciting. This is a book which deals with women in proverbs from around the world. So here in India, of course, as you know, we have uh, our own proverbs, which we shall come to later. But before we begin, I think it's important that Mirike tells us her story of how she got interested in the oral tradition uh, and the oral texts that have been passed down from centuries. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, dear Rita. <laughs> and uh, thank you for all being here. I feel very happy and honored to be in Jaipur today. It's my first visit to India. Um, yes, well, how did it all start? You know, uh, I uh, was already alive in the 1960s. And uh, that was a time when people in Europe said, we have so much knowledge, uh, it is better that this knowledge is to be uh, distributed, is to be more uh, equally div divided around the world. So, to make a long story short, uh, my husband and I decided to go and teach in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we were starting there working at a small university called Université Libre du Congo, the, the Free University of Congo. Now, I was teaching there uh, French literature mainly and started uh, also reading there because in my university in the Netherlands they never had uh, taught anything from Africa. So, in those novels, there were um, lots of white characters. So what did Africans say about us? And there uh, I understood that not only us, uh, we, we all believe we are the center of the world, but others have also ideas about us. So I found that there were parallels between the stereotypes in Europe about Africans. For example, they are lazy, they are uh, stealing, uh, they are sexually, they are interested in our women. Uh, and uh, so I found that similar stereotypes exist there. Uh, also, the Europeans were ste stealing everything. Uh, the Europeans were lazy because they made the, work, the Africans work for them. Uh, and uh, sexually, you couldn't trust them because they took all the charming young men or young women they were interested in, and so forth. So you see, it means uh, we, that the question becomes relevant for us, particularly in a globalizing world, is uh, what do we share? So in, in Congo, I started, uh, I hear, heard a lot of proverbs because people use them a lot in their daily life. So I scribbled them down and with my students we started uh, listening to grandfathers and grandmothers and the students wrote down the stories so we made nice little books uh, about animal stories and also about creation stories and a lot of proverbs too. So that was the beginning of uh, as other people collect stamps, I started collecting proverbs. And people asked me, how about Europe? You must have also proverbs. So I started thinking about it. Now, one of my, my grandmother, you always said, a girl, cover your knees, otherwise the stork will come. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, I think the stork is also more familiar here. So, so I have collected uh, from the Netherlands and then uh, I was working with people in China. Uh, I had projects with the Chinese Academy in Beijing. 
and uh, more and more people uh, shared their problems with me. Was I in a taxi somewhere? I asked the driver, uh, "Do you know any any proverb?" I was in London in a Turkish restaurant. I asked the owner, "Owner, do you know any proverbs from Turkey?" He said, "Yes, one. My father always quoted it, but I don't agree at all." Now, if I tell you this proverb, you will be shocked, probably, but let me shock you. The proverb went like this. Uh, a stick on the back and a child in the womb, that is the best way to control a woman. Yeah. So but he, he really assured me that he found it horrible, but he said, because you insisted, I <laughs> thought so I'd share it with you. Now, of course, such proverbs about violence are there, too, in the, in the book. There are lots of praising proverbs for about mothers. But if you look into the, the whole uh, kind of messages in, in the proverbs, uh, gradually, I collected more than 15,000 over the years. And then I published uh, this book, Never Marry a Woman with Big Feet. And of course, the big feet are the, the talents women have. And if you um, see uh, how a man uh, going to marry is warned very often by his own mother uh, to be careful. And um, so, uh, for example, in Congo, they said eating, the mother said to their sons who wanted to go marry, uh, Eating with a woman is eating with a witch. And I asked such a mother, what does it mean? And she said, you know, you can only trust people in your own family who have the same blood as you have. And, and those, this other woman, he must have a, a wife and, and produce progeny for the family. But uh, she comes from outside. Huh? She could poison him. She could... Uh, kill him in one way or another, by magic or by whatever. And this is why you see, and you know probably, uh, that widows uh, are always, uh, have a, all, not always, that in the prophets at least, they are seen as, uh, you, you shouldn't trust them. And um, so in England, there is a proverb saying, uh, never marry a widow unless her husband was hanged. Now, if he was a criminal, he was hanged, she couldn't have killed him. <laughs> so that's the only safe way to, to marry a widow. So then you look at it. You have also collected certain stories. Sorry. You've also collected certain stories on creation, yeah. the origin. Yes. of mankind, of humanity. Yeah. And I think it would be a good idea to share those as well with the audience because um, how was man created and how was woman created and how uh, down the ages it has happened yeah. with very few differences to start with, yeah. which yes. Yes. transform into yeah. major differences yes. in cultures. Yes. Now, some, uh, some other kind of question, what we share, uh, is uh, all of us have wondered where do we come from as human beings? Uh, who were our first ancestors? So uh, before people uh, wrote down any of these oral traditions, um, the uh, scholars or uh, archaeologists have digged up the oldest uh, statues, images, and all those oldest images are images of women and uh, of fertile women with uh, really uh, pronounced breasts and bellies and vulvas. And uh, so these are the very oldest before male images have been found. Now, one of the very interesting 
ancient stories. Uh, it comes from the, the Native American traditions, the Indian traditions. And uh, there you see the, the, the earth is represented as a, as a huge body, a female body. She is lying there. And she has lots of birth channels, and from all those birth channels, all life is coming up. Uh, the plants, the animals, and also human beings. Now, in newer versions of such stories, uh, suddenly and without any explanations, you find versions in which this body is still lying there, and now a man is sitting upon the body and he picks little bits from her body. He makes small balls, has a lot of balls around him, and then he says, well, let me create things, let me make things. And from all these balls he is creating plants and animals and also human beings. Now, what is interesting about the, the, the creation and origin stories is how the, the house of storytelling, the oldest houses of one house for humanity of storytelling, you see, you see changes coming about. And, um, so, for example, there is a Huso story from India saying this, there is heaven and there is earth, and heaven says, look, you are too big, how can I take you? I can't, you have to shrink. And the earth obediently was shrinking, and only after that, because of the shrinking, the, the valleys and mountains were created. And after that, heaven was able to go to her in love. Now, you see here again, like in the, the title of the book of the Proverbs, there is something about uh, the female uh, is too powerful to be handled. Uh, and why is she so powerful? Because she is the one giving life. Uh, and the imbalance was created fr right from the start because her, um, from her body comes her own kind, girls, but also boys. Uh, whereas the other sex is not giving life in, the, in, the same, in, in this way. And this is why uh, some older storytellers and even a Greek poet like Hesiod, he says, this is very unfortunate uh, that we cannot create our own progeny, ourselves. Now in Greece, you see in ancient Greece, there was a lot of, of homoerotic love, uh, but they still needed uh, uh, a woman for them to produce progeny. And that makes that there are some stories in which you do not need a womb at all. I have also a story from India, a Gadab story. Uh, in the beginning there is one man and one woman, and the woman dies. And the man in the night, the, the, this man is very poor. He has a cow and he has a hut and a small cover for his bed. So in the night he has a wet dream, so this little cover, he puts it on the roof of his hut. The cow comes, it eats the cover, and then the cow is pregnant. And the cow gives birth to the first ancestor, the first man and the first woman. Uh, so you need a container <laughs> to put the child inside, whether it's a womb <laughs> or a cow, uh, it, uh, it, it makes clear there will be progeny. Yes. So, uh, talking about uh, the Proverbs, 
in India also, uh, talking about the proverbs, in India also, we have uh, uh, proverbs which are uh, uh, lending an exalted status to uh, women as the mother goddess. But at the same time, there are other proverbs which are demeaning and which uh, uh, place the women uh, as the secondary citizen. So there are stories which, are, which reflect gender. There are proverbs and stories which reflect gender biases. For example, investing in a daughter is like watering another man's garden. When a, there's a very deeply internalized son preference in India, so uh, if a mother bears daughters, then it is often said that she doesn't bear children, she bears stones. So these are the kind of uh, uh, proverbs which have uh, been there for centuries, mm -hmm. they've come down for centuries. Yeah. And uh, also uh, the women have always, it, it has been believed, especially in the societal norms that exist, that they are the ones with lesser brains. Mm -hmm. So there are proverbs which say that their brains lie in their plaits or their <laughs> braids in the hair. And uh, they are not allowed to accompany the entourage of the bridegroom because they are not considered good enough. Mm -hmm. They say that uh, yeah, they, they yeah. should not be attending sure. the wedding yeah. uh, and going in the groom's party. So those are the kind of things that I have heard in the villages where I work. And uh, they are disturbing, but then they have come down centuries. For example, never marry a woman with big feet is from China. No, no, this comes from originally from Africa. Okay, but yeah. there's also a the Chinese yeah, it's, context to it. Yeah, 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 of course. Yes. You associated with the small feet in India. No, it comes from uh, Malawi and Mozambique, the people called uh, Sena. But when I quoted this proverb in Beijing, in a huge uh, audience, and there was one man who said, yes, but we have the same one, because we say uh, a woman will, with long feet ends up alone in a room, and she will never find a husband. Now, in the past, uh, in China, uh, th there was this food binding. And uh, why were the, f the feet uh, made smaller? Uh, it was sexually very attractive to the man because he put his little feet uh, in his mouth and there was a sp particular smell of, the, of these uh, bound feet. And uh, that must have been a very particular experience. But it also meant she couldn't walk away. She couldn't uh, go far uh, because of these miserable small feet. Uh, how can you run away, for example, in cases you feel uh, unhappy? Uh, so but I think the most important uh, meaning of these uh, big feet in the title of the book, uh, it has it must have to do with insecurity of men. That you have so many messages uh, telling men who want to marry, uh, take a wife smaller than you are, younger than you are, uh, with less uh, education than you have, and particularly she should not be too much visible in the public space. Uh, because your friends might ridicule you uh, if, uh, if uh, you have had, for example, less success in life than, than she, that is almost uh, unbearable. So what you see then is how much the men marry down and the women try to marry up. Right, right. So this was an international bestseller. It has been translated into several languages across the world. And uh, it won the Eureka Prize for uh, mm -hmm. Menike. And the second book that we have, it's quite a record. The second book that we have here with us is the history of dressing and undressing around the world. It's really a very, very interesting topic. And here, 
Again, how did this idea germinate from? Yeah. To write a whole book about dressing and undressing. Yes, well, um, I was invited in, that, in Tanzania once. Um, um, I went to see Zanzibar. From Dar es Salaam, I went on the ferry to, to go to Zanzibar. Now, on the, on the ferry, it was stormy. I was dressed about like I'm dressed now. And uh, there were three uh, women in niqab standing next to me on the ferry. And uh, two of them were very, didn't feel well. And they had to vomit because of the, the, the movements of the ferry. So they had to put their niqab over their head on the back. And um, so after a while I said, are you okay again? How are you now? And so we started talking. And then they said to me, you know, the way you are dressed, huh? are you aware that you will end up in hell? <laughs> uh, because you're not decently covered. And I said, well, I think uh, Allah will ask us whether we have been good people in our lives. Yes, yeah, no, but you see, the, the most important thing is for women, have to be decently covered and you have to cover your face. And uh, why don't you make a photograph of us? Because uh, then you can show it to your friends in the Netherlands because or, or in Europe. Uh, because you will all go to hell. So, um, so I made a photograph, but I had forgotten to put the niqab over their faces again. And then they realized this was the wrong photograph. So they put the niqab decently over the faces and said, please, now you can make the right photograph. With only the eyes. Yeah. But then, coming back into uh, in the Netherlands, uh, oh, there were in, uh, in Amsterdam those ads uh, for, for dressing, etc. And the poster said, dress less to impress. <laughs> so you see the contrast uh, to what happened on the ferry. So I started wondering, uh, what does it mean? And uh, my idea is that in fact, uh, those two messages uh, are two sides of the same coin, in fact. And uh, the, this coin is that women are always judged uh, because of the way, uh, for their appearance. Uh, it's not interesting whether she has other talents, uh, whether she is, is fat or, or thin or uh, whatever, but the looks are still there. And uh, interestingly, uh, in my room here, I put a television on and there were all these hotels of this whole... Uh, G. Yeah, the G. Yeah, yeah, the ITC. Now, it's all about food and about uh, drinking and, and uh, all is lovely, massage, etc. Et but uh, in between the beautiful sights, there is always a, 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 an attractive woman walking around. Now, as a, as a woman being in the hotel, you might think, there is never an attractive man walking around, <laughs> <laughs> making it interesting from the other perspective. So, you see, these, you notice these uh, things. So I think uh, the women are there uh, more as a kind of food to be, to be eaten. And interestingly, in the Proverbs, uh, there is a, a lot of metaphors about men as eaters and women as food. Uh, so uh, the, the men uh, some are the very hungry ones. They are uh, not so <laughs> choicey. Uh, they are like crocodiles, uh, you're not very choosy in what you want to eat. But uh, there are lots of these interesting little messages. Uh, they are full of meaning. Uh, and the more you, 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 you notice this, uh, then 
you you think well uh, the hierarchy has been built up uh, first of all of course in the in the mid uh, how it should be and then in uh, the, the the programs are a sort of advertising all the time uh, to keep the hierarchy in place yes. so the nuanced messages are actually to let the order be the way it is and the change is resisted yeah, yeah. but you have to tell us the story about the lollipops there is a very interesting story oh, yeah. that uh, yeah. Nikke shared with me uh, which I would definitely want shared with the audience yeah you know um, the more I traveled the more I found these uh, similar ideas based about what we share is our bodies uh, the bodies of the men and the bodies of the, the women uh, are, are put into a sort of system. Now, uh, one day I was walking through Cairo in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, uh, several of my books have been uh, translated into Arabic. And I saw uh, lots of posters in the streets uh, and there were two lollipops on the posters. One decently covered with a cellophane paper and the other was without. Now on this other one without the cellophane paper was uh, there were lots of fle uh, flies landing on the lollipop and underneath it was written, uh, a friend who was uh, telling me what it meant in Arabic, uh, your creator had a good purpose uh, for you uh, and you see what will happen if you are not decently covered, uh, then the flies will come. So the next day I had a, a presentation at the Cairo University. And uh, so I said, look, um, I think in the discussion we have to talk about these posters. Because I've, I felt shocked when I saw that. I have five brothers. I have a wonderful husband, I have two sons, and I must tell you, they are not flies. Uh, they are human beings, uh, and so human beings, they have uh, consciousness, they have brains, and they are not only having instincts driving them uh, to grab any woman they f find on their way. So uh, I think we should change our perspectives on men, and men are responsible people. Uh, so uh, we have to address them in that way. So we had a long conversation and, and uh, students were telling about how sometimes they were harassed, uh, harassed in, the, in the streets or get commands or, uh, you know, I think uh, there is a lot of upbringing and, and making uh, the situation different because, well, this happens all the time. Yes. Uh, going back to this book on uh, naked or covered, on the dressing and undressing, uh, you talked about the first garment or the piece of clothing that was ever created. What was that first garment? Where did it come from? Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Well, the, uh, you know, the first garment, uh, was the penis wrapper because you know when all people go naked still because it's warm why should you put anything on your body but you know uh, the men when they had an erection uh, the the women were giggling and so one of the reasons uh, it was also protection of course but uh, uh, for the other reason, for the giggling of the women, uh, they they put no, more nicer and, and decorated penis wrappers, uh, very impressive. Uh, so you see, there there are there are a lot of interesting little uh, stories you could tell about uh, about the garments. Also, uh, you see, we all. Uh, show some of our some parts of our body without any embarrassing in the public space, and others we would never 
show uh, now uh, other parts of our bodies to the whole world. Uh, but so the, the rules for that are sometimes different. Uh, for example, in Japan, the neck uh, was taboo to, to show. And in Victorian England, it was the heel. Well, it would be very shocking to show your heel. Um, and so you see that sometimes you can show the belly, uh, and then other parts you cannot show your belly, for example. So, uh, well, more details in the book. Uh, it is, it's quite interesting, but um, as from the 19th century, uh, at least in Europe, uh, people, the men were covering themselves with less ornaments. Uh, in the past, they, 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 they decorated themselves as much as women, or even more sometimes. And gradually they said, no, 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 this is not really what is most important. Our talents are more important. So there you see coming in uh, the difference uh, with the women. The women had to dress up more and more and more. And the men said, no, for us, yeah, just uh, common dress. And uh, so that's it, because it's much more important our other qualities. Now I think how to redress this balance so that the qualities for the women are as important as for the men and not only uh, what I call uh, appearance slavery. Uh, women have been uh, reduced very often and also cooperate, collaborate in the system uh, themselves. Yes. The third book is the Hills of Paradise. This is the latest uh, offering by Mineke and it was published this July. Uh, this book is uh, again very interesting because it looks at power, powerlessness and the female body. And uh, the title of this book, The Hills of Paradise, um, comes from a poem which is actually a student song in Latin. And I shall read this poem to you uh, for the reasons that it underscores. Softly shines her virgin bosom and the breasts that gently rise like the hills of paradise. Oh, the joys of this possessing. From her tender breasts decline in a gradual curving line Flanks like swans down, white and fine. Neat the waist, her belly turneth unto fullness. Where below, in love's garden, lilies grow. Oh, the joys of this possessing. Now, what is underscored here is that why this body is beautiful, but the naked body is the property of the man looking at it. Touching it, describing it, and praising it. So, ultimately reduced to prop, a piece of property. And that is what this book is about. You can tell us a little more about this book and about how the insecurities have arisen over the years and that have, has led to a violence streak in the discourse on women. This was uh, medieval times, but even in modern times, as you uh, will see in this book, the students are belting out lyrics which are also sexually targeted and they have a violent streak in them. So the old order has not changed very much. Yeah, well, yeah, we started, we, we were talking about uh, how this power of life-giving uh, was intimidating. And uh, from that basic, uh, well, fact, um, the storytelling, uh, the, the house of storytelling has been renovated <coughs> gradually. And so, having collected a number of these uh, creation stories, 
uh, there are all kinds of um, elements telling us how this imbalance right from the beginning um, has been uh, put into a new balance uh, by limiting women in many other aspects. If you do already the birth giving, uh, why should you also have education? Uh, why should you be an artist? Why should you be a, a, a prominent musician uh, if you are uh, very good in sports? Uh, all this is too much. Uh, and it's all about redressing the balance. So what I found is first of all the the, the stories of the of this life giving has been taken over by um, by the male gods gradually. Uh, and so if you can think uh, back uh, to this um, the earth as a powerful body. Uh, autonomously uh, producing life. Uh, then there has been this, this little man sitting. And then you have heaven and earth. Heaven saying to earth, look how this is too much. But finally you find the supreme God is mainly a male, uh, uh, addressed as a male, very often. Uh, not always, but very often. And then you see that the life-giving task uh, uh, is handled by this supreme God. Uh, uh, you, for example, it's evident in the, in the uh, Abrahamic religions, the Judaism, Christianity and Islam, uh, all the, um, the partners of the, the supreme God have been, uh, have been fading away or have been undone. Uh, and uh, we know about uh, Mohammed uh, in his struggle uh, when he was on the way to Mecca. Uh, all the, the the very popular three goddesses were there, and they were uh, their temples had to be destroyed everywhere. Now, what you see in these uh, creation stories, uh, you see how um, uh, the god gives the life eh, and he's addressed as a he. So um add to the mic. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, sorry. And so Adam and Eve were created uh, by the God. But uh, interestingly uh, what happens to Adam, uh, he has been created first and he's longing for a partner. Now when Eve is created uh, in one of the stories, they are created equally. But in the other story, God takes a body part from Adam and uh, he builds Eve on this rib. Uh, but gradually, in the stories, I don't know whether you have ever seen these, uh, these images of Adam sleeping in paradise and God is standing next to him as a sort of midwife. And he pulls Eve from Adam's body. Uh, and then in the story it said from his side. But side is a euphemism for his genitals. So uh, instead of saying this uh, first woman is giving birth, uh, no, uh, she comes from his body. Because the important lesson was, or, or uh, recommendation was, you know, there is one who can be head of the family. Of course, that should be the man. So if we show to the illiterate masses of Europe uh, uh, about how it went, then you only see uh, the wife coming from her husband's body. Uh, so it was an incestuous re <laughs> relation, in fact. Uh, but no, then the theologians said, no, 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 it was not, there was no other possibility, so for that, uh, this was uh, acceptable in this case. Now, there are quite a few um, gods uh, who shape the creation with their own hands, or they throw 
the creation from the uh, uh, bodies, like, uh, for example, the god Bumba in, in Kasai in Congo. Uh, he first of all throws up plants and then animals and finally a lot of uh, humans. But Zeus, the supreme god of the Greeks, and he gives birth to his daughter, Pallas Athena, from his head. Uh, and so there are lots of such examples of, instead of procreation, as was the first thing that was in the stories important, and then it became fabrication. You fabricate humans with your own hands. Now, and when you look into many of those stories, uh, first of all, I was just reading, very interesting, but I said, well, you know, sometimes the God makes the first man with his right hand and the first woman with his left hand. So, probably, that's why I'm talking, but when you read many, many, many of them, uh, you find similar hierarchical details. For example, the first uh, human is a man, he is created from the highest quality of material the god has. But when he has finished this first perfect creature, uh, he runs out of material. So when he wants to create the first woman, he, is, uh, he has to use inferior material. So, Hierarchy is yeah. re-established. Yeah. Yes. So there are many of such examples. You will find more examples in the book. So the whole scenario is about power and powerlessness. Yeah. And gender disparities continue to exist. In yeah. your opinion, what is it that we can do to reduce these gender disparities and to move towards a more equitable, more just world? Yeah. Now, I think, first of all, um, it is important for us to be aware of uh, the history of humanity, you see. Uh, if there is an imbalance at the beginning, uh, how was this balance created, in fact, in an, in an unfair way? Uh, because you can say the, the women had, in this way, a sort of head start but they ended in a sort of back, uh, backlog. Uh, and uh, I think the, the women themselves uh, should be more aware of, of where they come from. And particularly, the role of mothers is very crucial in all this. Uh, if you uh, want to prepare your sons for the tough world outside, uh, I think you shouldn't pamper them too much. Because if you pamper them more than the daughters, the daughters will think, you know, I'm not so much pampered as my brother. I better take care of myself. So she is better prepared to go into the outside world because she, uh, uh, so she's better prepared. But if you have been pampered too much, uh, the outside world is a difficult world. So equality in the home is a, is a good preparation. Uh, you see equality in the, in the little jobs that have to be done in the house. And not thinking now the girls have to do this because I am a boy. Uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that creates already uh, a mentality that is not helping to to improve the, the, the situation. But it's maybe the most important thing is that we each know each other's insecurities. You know, uh, the, the, the insecurity of the man that you have to be powerful and no fear. Uh, well, we have those uh, sto uh, stories we were talking yesterday about. There is the vagina dentata uh, which means there, there are lots of stories around it showing how fearful uh, sexuality can be for men. Uh, that you, you think you know uh, this vulva, um, it is tricky, uh, this is the, 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 the gate of life in fact. But when I enter, so there are stories that there are lots of teeth 
and my most vulnerable body part has to go there. So how and so he approaches the, uh, the the girl he has to marry and thinks, hmm, I hear teeth gnashing under her skirt. So that is very scary, of course. So he uh, tries to give her drugs or some alcohol, and then he very carefully he removes the teeth. And underneath, there is a normal uh, female uh, body. But uh, in the stories, he's represented as a real hero to be able to do this. Uh, now, what do these stories mean? They, they mean uh, that there is fear on the, on the side of the man. Uh, and fear can enter, can enter up in violence easily. And for the women, um, for the girls, you see, over the centuries, um, the messages in the Proverbs, as you will see, <coughs> they are belittling women very much. She has long hair, no brains, uh, you know, and all these, these hierarchies. One of my uh, favorite Proverbs is Chinese. And it, it is really about hierarchy. It goes like this. Um, if a teapot can serve five teacups, but who has ever seen one teacup serving five teapots? Uh, this is about sex, of course. Uh, so the, the, the teapot, the, the patiently waiting cups are filled by the teapot. Uh, and how could a teacup there address me as a teapot. Uh, this is really impossible. Now you see all these these small elements in uh, all these messages, uh, and you find them in a lot of ways uh, in the in the in the food and the eaters and in 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 many other ways in all sorts of stories. Uh, and uh, particularly the basis is the origin stories, where do we come from, and then uh, where, we, uh, where we are now. So, shall we open the uh, conversation to the audience now? We will take a few questions. Hi, good evening. Uh, this is a very interesting session. Uh, uh, my question to you is, we've been talking about proverbs. And all of them uh, belittling women, made by men, and that clearly indicates that men were always fearful that they are not the upper one. The women are more intelligent, mm -hmm. so that's why they are to be belittled. That's why they are to be told that you are the one who has to go down, who, who are the uh, lesser ones. So do you feel that women are basically the stronger ones and that's why men were always creating proverbs for them, just to be little men? Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't think this is always the case. But you see, um, the fact, uh, it is like in the home, you see, if you have, if you are too much pampered, you see, uh, you are not feeling like uh, trying to, to to make a lot of efforts. Uh, and um, in, in the province, for example, you find how powerful women are uh, in, in work. Uh, they can work endlessly, they have jobs outside, but then, uh, if, if you have, don't have a husband, cooperating in, uh, in cooking or cleaning or whatever, uh, then, uh, well, uh, you do the two jobs without complaining, and uh, instead of saying, look, I'm tired, uh, why don't you cook tonight? Uh, so I told uh, Mita that uh, my daughters-in-law praised me, and you brought these boys up very well, because when we go out as women friends and have dinner together, uh, all my other friends say, 
Look, I first had to cook at home before I could go and have our dinner. And then my daughters-in-law say, oh, well, our, our husbands are doing the job uh, easily. They have learned how to do this at home. So, so sensitizing men and boys is a good strategy. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, there's one more. Yeah. Lovely. Hi, good evening to all. It is lovely listening to the conversation. My question is, did you find any proverbs regarding men first? And uh, which country did you think had the most proverbs regarding men? Clearly, women, men are obsessed all the whole over, you know. But any country which has proverbs with men, you know, and any interesting one. And most of these proverbs that we've talked about are related to women. The, yeah, but yeah. what about the proverbs which are pertaining to men? Yes, well, you know, it's a mistake to think that they are only about women. In fact, they are at least as much about men. Uh, uh, there are uh, traditions where the women are not allowed to call proverbs. Uh, but um, don't forget that the women, the mothers, are praised everywhere. Uh, you can have uh, a lot of friends or brothers or sisters, but you only have one mother. But yes, if the mother does not prepare the children for the life outside, uh, then they, they, they emphasize uh, and continue the ways it has been. Uh, and, and it's so important to be aware, and this is why I, I said to Nita yesterday, uh, in, uh, if we don't know where we come from, we are better prepared to know where we want to go. This is, uh, where are we now and where do we want to go? Which of our traditions do we pass on to our children and grandchildren? And which traditions are not so good? Some people are so naive as uh, saying you have, we have to cuddle all our traditions because they are so wonderful. But watch out. <laughs> Some are very important and we, we cherish them, we want to keep them. But we also have to question, yeah, uh, in, the, in the face of social justice, uh, equality, and uh, now today, uh, the women don't have to produce a child every year. So after one or two, you, you can deploy all your talents. And the, the humanity, the world needs so many talents, and this is what we have to profit from all over the world. It is Thank important. Uh, any more? Yes. In your studies across the world, I'm sure you would have found a society or two somewhere where women hold a dominant position. Mm -hmm. Is that so? Some anywhere? A society where women hold the dominant position in your studies across the world, in your research, have you come across societies where women are the more prominent? Yes, yeah. Uh, you know, I think in the past, uh, more often than later, uh, the, 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 the groom went to live with the family of uh, his wife. Many uh, matrilocal uh, traditions have disappeared, partly because the men uh, were less at ease in the family of the, of the wife uh, than in his own family, and he felt more privileged to stay with his own family, and more and more obediently his wife uh, went alone. So that is one thing, and a colonization uh, has done a bad thing too, because uh, the way it was hierarchical and patriarchal in, uh, in Europe, 
they have brought and they have reinforced this system uh, in the colonies too. So, uh, if you look at the, there are some uh, of, of these uh, maps in the book, uh, you can see how it has been reduced. So, the, the, there are still a few. Uh, for example, uh, the Minangkabau in Indonesia, on the island Sumatra, uh, there, this has been preserved. And the women say uh, there, you know, men are like a little dust on the tree trunk. Or they are like a fly uh, on the cow's tail. So what, uh, so here the flies. The, 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 in the roads are reversed. Yeah. The, the roads of the fly are yeah. But it is, uh, there are a few, but it has uh, been reduced more and more. And you see, if a system is in place, it's very difficult. We need a lot of efforts altogether. Uh, so instead of going along with the, the past, uh, I think men and women, uh, the best thing is to, to talk about your mutual fears. If you can't do that, uh, you will see miracles happen. Uh, because if you can be honest with each other, uh, you, you also trust each other much better than uh, staying uh, and, and go along with the old traditional flow. Uh, I think uh, the world will be better in shape uh, because it will reduce violence in many ways. Uh, because violence uh, is a result of enormous fears and insecurities. So if we can talk about these insecurities that the women have heaped up in their brainwashed uh, heads, um, if they can talk about this, look, uh, our parents, we are very insecure about this. Uh, let, let me talk about it. And then he can say, look, uh, I have my own insecurities. So why should I always perform and show how important I am? Uh, I'm also a human being. I have my fears. I have my sadness. I have my insecurities. And then you can bloom, both of you, yes. in the relationship. So it's about conversations and discussions and honesty and respect and mutual understanding. Thank you very much for a very engaging session and your insightful yeah. approach to these subjects. Thank you very yeah. much. Can I end up with my favorite proverb? It is Tibetan and it says, a hundred male and a hundred female qualities make a perfect human being. Oh. <laughs> On an absolutely perfect note, uh, can we please give a huge round of applause to Dr. Mila uh, for your time a very, very insightful and thought-provoking conversation, I think. Uh, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Uh, may I call upon Mr. Ajit Singh to please felicitate our guests? We are honored. Thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.